The signs began appearing on every telephone pole up and down the street. Persons of Japanese ancestry evacuate within 30 days. As we packed and got ready to move out, I said to my mother, You know, this is against the Constitution. They didn't give us a trial and now they're going to jail us. And my mother responded, Oh, shut up and pack. The Army ordered the exclusion of all persons of Japanese ancestry from coastal areas of California. I was born and raised Oregon, in America. Washington, and then all of a sudden, I'm not an American. I'm nothing. And now America is going to put me in a concentration camp, take away all my rights. We traveled to a temporary center at a country fairground because the permanent camps were not completed. We were given these baggage tags with this number, and we had to wear it on all our garments and everything we carried. In other words, we weren't a family name anymore. We were family 6051. I was 18, and oddly enough, I didn't feel anger or the hatred that I had at first. I guess my thoughts were on survival, to survive this thing and see where it leads us. I had no idea what was going to happen to us. Well, being a student at the time, we knew that uh, it was against the uh, Constitution of the United States, against the Bill of Rights. Uh, here, we um, lost our freedom and we lost our citizenship shortly thereafter because they classified all of us as uh, enemy aliens. And so in one swoop, we lost everything. Uh, the main thing was uh, the freedom and citizenship. And uh, that, uh, that was entirely against the Constitution. It seemed that the uh, Constitution failed us. Uh, we had no more power. The Constitution was no longer protecting us. The country was no longer protecting us for our life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So what can we do? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Gopher Broke National Education Center's public program, The Lasting Legacy of Fred Korematsu. My name is Mitch Maki, and I am the president of Gopher Broke National Education Center. And on behalf of the board and the staff, I want to personally thank you for braving the elements today and joining us here at the Tatiuchi De Democracy Forum. The voices that you just heard at the end were the voices of two veterans who fought for this country during World War II, and I think their, their words are very poignant in regards to the discussion that we are about to have. Before we go forward, one quick housekeeping note. For all of you that are here today, your admission to the forum also allows you to enter into Gopher Broke's National, Edu and National Education Center's Defining Courage exhibition and also the Japanese American National Museum. So please plan on joining us afterwards. It'll probably still be raining, so it'll be nice to be indoors. 75 years ago, the United States was thrusted into World War II after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Japanese Americans immediately began to worry what would happen to us. Would we be treated as US citizens and protected by the Constitution? Or would we be considered the enemy because of a shared heritage? Well, we received our answer two months later when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which set the underpinnings for the forced exclusion from the West Coast and the incarceration of nearly 120,000 individuals of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of whom were American citizens by birth. Despite this most egregious violation of the Constitution, Japanese American young men and women joined the military service and served our nation. The 100th Battalion and 442nd Regimental Combat Team would become the most highly decorated unit of its size in American military history. The Military Intelligence Service would be credited for ending the war in the Pacific two years early. The 232nd Engineer Combat Team and the Japanese-American women who served in the Women's Army Corps 
and an Army Nurse Corps served with distinction. They served because it was their way of preserving freedom. They served because it was their way of promoting equality. They served because it was their way of protecting America, even though America had failed to protect them. Now, courage comes in many forms, and along with the valor of the Japanese-American veterans, individuals like Fred Korematsu demonstrated courage and conviction in challenging the exclusion orders during World War II. His landmark case represents a very dark history in the US Supreme Court. 40 years later, however, in 1983, a pro bono team of attorneys headed by Dale Minami secured a federal district court ruling to overturn the original Korematsu trial conviction. Despite this victory, the Supreme Court decision, albeit discredited, still remains. Today, we find ourselves faced with a social political environment that feels painfully like pre-World War II. There is growing discussion across our nation regarding how best to address national security concerns and suggestions for a registry or an incarceration of individuals based solely on their race, their nation of origin, or the faith that they believe have been introduced. Today's panelists, Dale Minami and Paul Hoffman, will address the legacy of the Korematsu case and the subsequent writ of Quorum Nobis case as they pertain to these issues. Our first speaker is Mr. Dale Minami. Mr. Minami is recognized as one of the top personal injury lawyers in the San Francisco Bay Area. In addition, he has been significantly involved in landmark decisions such as United Filipinos for Affirmative Action versus California Blue Shield, the first class action suit brought by Asian Pacific Americans on behalf of Asian Pacific Americans. Spokane, JACL versus Washington State University, a class action on behalf of Asian Pacific Americans to establish an Asian American Studies program at Washington State University. And of course, Nakanishi versus UCLA, a claim for unfair denial of tenure that resulted in the granting of tenure after several hearings and widespread publicity over discrimination in academia. But Mr. Manami is here with us today because of his, of his historic leadership in the writ of Coram Nobis lawsuit, which overturned the 40-year-old trial conviction of Fred Korematsu. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Dale Manami. Thank you, everybody. It's uh, nice to be here. I really appreciate you braving the elements. And for uh, I grew up in LA, in Gardena, so coming here in the rain is no small task. And uh, I'm glad you're finally getting some rain as well. So um, I'd like to also thank Gopher Broke and Mitch Maki. Mitch is, if you don't know, an author who wrote Achieving the Impossible Dream, a, a chronicle of the redress movement, and made a major contribution to uh, our understanding of how redress has actually occurred. Um, also, Gopher Broke, I'd like to thank for inviting me here and for the Japanese American National Museum for allowing us uh, this space to work on. You know, we just suffered an inauguration of uh, perhaps one of the worst presidents that we may see. And uh, some of you may support him, and that's fine. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Paul Hoffman, that I'm really honored to be with, an ACLU lawyer is going to defend your First Amendment rights. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't remember in my generation a white supremacist and a person who's going to uh, have declared so much damage that he will do to people of color, uh, marginalized communities, women, among others. And in four weeks, exactly, we will commemorate the Day of Remembrance, Executive Order 9066, a day of infamy, where President Roosevelt issued that order that sent 110,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry to prison. It's dangerous times, and uh, it's fitting, I think, to discuss what happened in World War II, 1942, the legal cases, and also the lessons that we gained. The legal cases themselves are so Complex. I'm only going to give you a brief summary, just to hit the highlights. But you know, I could talk for a long time on this. And as my older brother Roland is here, can attest, I could probably talk a long time for anything. Uh, 
But this we know. In 1942, 110,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of whom American citizens, were sent to the nether reaches of this country without notice of the charges, without the right to an attorney, without to a trial, without the right to a trial. They included the infirm, they included children, like my brother Roland was uh, one year old at the time and at that point uh, considered a danger to this country. And they were banished from their homes and uh, exiled to these godforsaken places where they had suffered indefinite confinement. The crime was racial ancestry. The justification, oh, excuse me, I missed uh, my uh, cue here. And what I wanted to do is just show a couple pictures. I'm not used to using PowerPoint, I was, as all those we were talking about, and just to get you an idea, because we all, you know, a lot of us are Sansei or Yonsei, we don't remember, but a lot of folks who are here still do remember these kind of iconic and terrible inches, uh, terrible images. Um, we know that uh, the justification, the crime was racial ancestry, justification was military necessity. But we know that no Japanese American was ever charged, arrested, much less convicted of espionage or sabotage. Uh, we know that the Japanese Americans in Hawaii, where the largest group, grouping of Asian Americans or Japanese Americans lived, were not taken away en masse. And this is kind of perplexing because this is where Pearl Harbor was attacked, the situs of the start of the war. This is where our Pacific Naval Fleet were. And the question is very simply answered about why Hawaiian Japanese Americans were not taken away. And it was because of the virulent racism in this mainland community that allowed the politicians to uh, then pass laws that put people away. Three women, uh, three men and one woman stood up to challenge the orders. The Gordon Hirabayashi was a student in Seattle. Min Yasui was a young lawyer in Portland, Oregon. And Fred Korematsu was a welder in the San Francisco Bay Area in San Leandro. Mitsui Endo was a clerk typist at the DMV in Sacramento. And her case was a little bit different, so I'm not going to discuss her case, but the courage that she showed in agreeing to be a part of this, uh, this whole uh, group of people was, was very important. Um, all these cases went to the Supreme Court, and they uh, were collectively, the three men's cases were collectively brought together. And the court really essentially manipulated the, uh, uh, the procedures so that the first set of cases were really uh, Gordon Hirabayashi and Minyasui. And in, in that case, and then Korematsu came up a year and a half later. And that was a deliberate plan because they had to sp split them up in order to achieve the kind of result the court wanted to. Um, they represent some of the worst decisions ever filed by the United States Supreme Court. Uh, very criticized, every law student reads them, and uh, are rarely cited today. Um, Hirabayashi was the first case to go, and in that uh, case, the court upheld, uh, the Supreme Court upheld the curfew. It was decided by eight justices, one had yet to be appointed. Five of the eight were appointed by President Roosevelt, the very man a very official whose, whose orders they were uh, required to analyze. Uh, it's like having you know, your own family be your umpire at baseball games. Uh, Korematsu was decided with a six to three majority. Three justices dissented, mm -hmm. violently or vi uh, vehemently dissented. Um, and I'll talk about those later. But in all the cases, the courts essentially abdicated the responsibility to analyze the facts and make a judgment. They deferred to the judgment of the military without, almost, without any question almost that the Japanese Americans had the potential of espionage and sabotage and that ethnic affiliations in the case of the Japanese Americans could be considered by the military to determine that they were predisposed to disloyalty and therefore espionage and sabotage. There was no evidence, no proof in the record of this except naked assertions and some half-baked truths and some pseudo-psychological, sociological evidence. No expert witnesses testified at the trial court level. So then what the court relied on is essentially stereotypes and some cultural and sociological information. You could read them yourself, but they're, if you went to a Japanese language school, if you sent your kids uh, for schooling in Japan, um, 
And one interesting thing is he said, yeah, the Japanese could be predisposed to loyal because of the, the racial antagonism and hostility against them all these years. So it's, instead of sending the victims of the racial discrimination, uh, instead of sending the, the, the perpetrators of discrimination away, they send the victims away. It was, in, sense, in a sense, an exercise in massive racial profiling. The decisions were really weak, too. And um, they would make, in Hirabayashi particularly, they would make uh, a high school English teacher cringe with their use of double negatives. So instead of asserting something strongly, they say, we cannot reject as unfounded the judgment of military authorities that there were disloyal members of that population whose numbers and strength could not be precisely and quickly ascertained. Later on, they say, we cannot say that the war-making branches did not have grounds for believing in a critical hour that such persons could not be isolated and separately de uh, dealt with. It's kind of like coming home on Valentine's Day, which is going to happen in three weeks, and saying to your significant others, honey, I cannot say I do not love you. <laughs> you, would not get a, you would not get away with that. The Supreme Court got away with it. But they can't tell you how many Japanese Americans were dangerous. They even admit it. They can't tell you what their strength is. So what they do is they throw up their hands and say, OK, we'll just believe what you're saying, military authorities. Korematsu came by later, and it really adopted, parroted, essentially, the uh, uh, Hirabayashi decision on racial characteristics using double negatives. But it was different in, a, in, a, in an important way. The court uh, uh, declared some with magniloquence about civil rights, these phrases that are really significant. And the, all legal restrictions which curtail the rights of a single racial group are immediately suspect. Courts must subject restrictions to the most rigid scrutiny. Only the gravest imminent danger to public safety can justify such great deprivations. Wonderful words, words that you would think, OK, well, if, that's, if this only applied to Japanese Americans and there's no evidence of danger, you know, they're going to win. But these beautiful words really hid uh, without analysis, blindly accepting the military judgment, um, hid the massive deprivations that they were approving. So ironically, while the court says all these things, it ignore, ignores its own words and then says, well, yeah, but you know, we're going to believe the military. And Fred Korematsu, you lose your case. The exclusion of Japanese Americans <clears throat> is upheld. What is remarkable toward the end is the circumvention or, uh, of the Supreme Court. It avoids completely the issue of race, almost completely. And it dismisses it with just one sentence. Uh, Korematsu was not excluded from the military areas because of hostility to him or his race. Well, I can't think of any other reason he was excluded other than his race, and no one, could, no one else can. But what's notable also for Korematsu is three vehement dissents. Justice Murphy says, such exclusion goes beyond, uh, goes over the very brink of constitutional power and falls in the ugly abyss of racism. I dissent, therefore, from this legalization of racism. Pretty direct speaker, I'd say. Justice Jackson uh, penned a really notable dissent that became famous. The court for all time has validated the principle of racial discrimination. The principle then lies around, about like a loaded weapon, ready for the hand of any authority that could bring forward a plausible claim of urgent need. Despite those uh, three dissents, Korematsu is affirmed, his conviction is affirmed, and it becomes one of two cases in modern his, uh, legal history that affirm a racial discrimination, invidious discrimination against a racial minority. The other one is the Hirabayashi case. 30 years pass. Japanese Americans go back and try to rebuild their broken lives, try to raise their family. They try to forget what happened. But the fire of the civil rights movement ignites the imagination of many Americans, people of color, and Japanese Americans as well. And the redress movement is forged out of that fire and born, creating the, uh, the movement to demand $20,000 in an apology from the United States government. Coincidentally, two researchers uh, meet up in the archives accidentally, and they realize they're on the same mission to research 
the Korematsu case, the incarceration, to understand why this happened to us or happened to them. And they discover some very startling official documents, documents that prove that there was no military necessity, that allegations made in the Supreme Court about espionage or sabotage were outright lies. And even more, they found documents that the government officials knew of these refutations of their own arguments, contradictions of their own arguments, and suppressed, altered, and destroyed that evidence so they could win the cases at all costs in the Supreme Court. Together, those cases proved that a fraud was committed on the Supreme Court. The evidence is a little bit too detailed to uh, talk about, but let me just refer to a couple of them. One report was the uh, Ringo report, we call it, Office of Naval Intelligence, the, the uh, official in investigative uh, agency that looked into the Japanese-American situation. Ringo was a, uh, a colonel, and he um, uh, concluded that there is no reason to take away the Japanese Americans. They are not more disloyal than any other group. They could be dealt with with individual hearings, due process rights of being able to defend yourself in court. He recommended against the internment uh, and incarceration. That evidence was suppressed intentionally from the Supreme Court. The FBI also uh, recommended no inter incarceration. J. Edgar Hoover, who's no friend of civil rights, actually just said, you know, look at it. I've, I've got files on everyone. I know who's dangerous and who's not, so you don't, you don't have to take them all away. <laughs> I'll tell you the ones to take away. Uh, but they, they uh, ignored that and suppressed that. And then the F Federal Communications Commission and the FBI investigated allegations made by General DeWitt, the one who issued the orders. And General De DeWitt was the man who said a job is a job, and it max makes no difference if he's a citizen an avowed racist. But he claimed that Japanese Americans were committing espionage and sabotage. The FCC investigated every single report, and so did the FBI, and concluded they were all false. What's interesting, too, is that the attorneys knew about this information. They knew that they were telling lies in the court, and they continued to do so. However, a couple of attorneys in the Department of Justice were ethical attorneys, and they thought, you know, this is a problem. We need to do something about this evidence that we found. Re and regarding the espionage claims of um, uh, DeWitt that uh, overt act acts of treason were being committed, since this is not so, it is, they wrote to their superior, since this is not so, it is highly unfair to this racial minority that these lies put out in an official publication go uncorrected. Also, the official uh, investigation, the Ringel Report. Edward Annis, one of the attorneys, writes to the Solicitor General Superior, who's arguing in the Supreme Court, um, contradicts the governmental position, that we have a duty to advise the court of the existence of the Ringel Report. Any other course of conduct might approximate the suppression of evidence. This department has an ethical obligation to the court to re refrain from citing the Ringel Report. He was ignored. That memo was suppressed, the Ringel report was suppressed, and the court never saw that information at all. Finally, there's a discovery of the DeWitt report. DeWitt, again, the commander who uh, made the orders to exclude Japanese Americans, and that found its way into the Supreme Court in a backdoor way that is too long to explain now. But it became the centerpiece of the government's case. And in that report, he initial report, he says that well, you know, we can't tell the difference among Japanese. It's the only inscrutable argument. We can't tell loyal from disloyal. They're just too hard, they're, they're, they're uh, inscrutable. And so he writes then the initial report, he has to change it. The War Department officials require him to change it to say the Supreme Court will never buy that. We have to change it to say that there was not enough time. So they change the original argument that, oh, there was, it was not, it's not about insufficient time to essentially 180 degrees, there was insufficient time or no ready means. That discovery was found by Aiko Yoshinaga Herzig, who's from Gardena, or living there now too, and, um, and became a centerpiece of a number of, other a number of the cases that we brought, that they uh, altered these cases and didn't tell the Supreme Court that they had made that major, major uh, alteration. In 1982, I'm practicing in a private practice in, uh, in Oakland, I get a call from Peter Irons. 
And uh, Peter Irons tells me about all this evidence they have, which seems remarkable to me, and asks me if I'd like to help reopen these cases. And I told him, of course I did. Are those men still alive? This is 40 years later. And you know, there are names in a Supreme Court book uh, of cases that we all read, but we don't know that they're still alive. Um, and so they were. We form work teams. We have to create work teams in three cities, Portland, Seattle, and San Francisco, the venues where these men were convict convicted and tried. Uh, and Korematsu went first. Our strategy was to get three bites of the apple, too, to, to have a case in every court, and hopefully we, we'd get with the best judge first, which turned out to be San Francisco, Judge Marilyn Hall Patel. And on the day of her hearing, after quite a bit of uh, infighting and dis discovery of evidence, uh, we got our day in court in November 19th, 1983. The courtroom was filled, and there were a number of, uh, mostly Nisei, a lot of Issei, some Sansei, and uh, filled with news reporters and civil libertarians who wanted to hear this day in court. I, I opened by saying, we are here today to get a measure of justice denied to Fred Korematsu and the Japanese American people some 40 years ago. Fred got to talk and he, he ended by saying, I'm doing this so it never happens to another American again. And the court made a finding from the bench, which is unusual. Oh, excuse me, these are the three men. They all seem to be doing very well except for their smoking pipes. Uh, <laughs> it's Gordon, Min, and Fred. And this is a press conference because when we reopened the cases, there were uh, some major reasons. One is, you know, to overturn the convictions of these very courageous men, but also to wanted to put a nail in the coffin of the Korematsu precedent that you can uproot an entire race of people without notice hearing, without trial, without due process, and put them in prison for an indefinite confinement. We also wanted to correct history because we knew some people still felt there was some, some justification for imprisoning all these people. And, uh, and, and we felt they were wrongly uh, uh, informed, and we wanted to correct that record. It was also brought in the middle of the redress battle. So the opponents in, in Congress were saying, well, you know, it was legal. The Korematsu and Hirabayashi decision said it was legal. We needed to undermine that thought that narrative to allow our allies to say they were based on a foundation of fraud. They're discredited, and here's why. So when we finally got to court, Marilyn Hall Patel, well, here's, I don't know why I put this here. This is Ed Bradley from 60 Minutes. We uh, had to do a lot of education, and part of our job was to, you know, it, 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 to teach. It wasn't just the legal case. We saw our form as the court of public opinion. And so we finally, Fred, we told him, no, don't worry, you don't have to go to interviews. He was a shy man. But we kind of cultivated him, and one interview led to another, and finally we said, Fred, you're going to have to go on 60 Minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, my God. And, but he was very good about it. And Ed Bradley uh, came to the house I lived in, and uh, this is a break in, I should have showed the one with Fred, but this is a funnier one because he got hooked on Space Invaders and was <laughs> with his producer. We're playing Space Invaders in my living room. Uh, but it, the, the interview still exists, and it's a really fine interview. He was a very, very sympathetic reporter. So here's what the court said when we finally uh, got their uh, decision. The government deliberately omitted relevant information and provided misleading information in papers before the court. The facts for military ju justification were unsubstantiated facts, distortions, and representatives, uh, representations of at least one military commander whose views were seriously infected by racism. And with that, she vacated, the overturned Fred's conviction. And it was the first declaration that Japanese Americans did nothing wrong, that the government had lied to the Supreme Court, and that th those decisions were uh, discredited to that degree. Yasuo and Hirabayashi took different routes, and just quickly summarizing, Hirabayashi had to do a full-blown trial, had to go to the Court of Appeal, where Mary, Judge Mary Schroeder overturned Gordon's convictions. And she said, she concluded that racial bias was the cornerstone of the internment orders. In 1988, the redress bill is passed. Uh, uh, Japanese Americans achieved political redemption and validation for their beliefs that they did nothing wrong. 
They emerged from this darkness of the incarceration with 20,000 in apology. But more significantly, they emerged with a, a legacy, a legacy of great moral authority to speak out against injustice and intolerance in the future. So when we see today, what's happening today, that tension between national security and civil rights still exists, and it always has, from the Persian War to September 11th, to what's uh, terrorist acts, to what's going on now. The question arises about Korematsu being a precedent, and in several levels. The law, the cases, are they still precedent? But also the precedent of the incarceration. Is that a valid precedent to, to, uh, to support any kind of similar types of uh, government orders? Korematsu was never overruled, uh, but that's light years away from saying it is good law and should be cited as a precedent, a legal precedent for doing what was done to Japanese Americans. And I, I think most uh, critics will agree, and with a few outstanding uh, outliers, that these decisions are so discredited, they were so bad, they were so wrong, uh, that they should not be used again. And um, as, as shortly as six months after the Korematsu decision, a well-known law professor who became dean of Yale Law School, Eugene Rostow, wrote his scathing critique of the Korematsu decision. And most analysts, uh, analysts have followed in his footsteps and have condemned that decision as some of the first, uh, worst decisions ever made. Um, and so its status of Korematsu and Hirabayashi is what uh, Justice Schroeder writes, this is on, the Korematsu and Hirabayashi cases have never occupied an honored place in our history, a gross understatement. And Judge Patel says it even stronger, Kor Korematsu remains on the pages of our legal and political history, as a legal precedent is now recognized as having very limited application. So even judges, even uh, critics will say that Korematsu is not good law. I think that Korematsu is further undermined by the Coram Nobis cases we brought, which showed that the underlying facts of the decision that and the conclusions the court made were outright lies. They were misrepresentations. They were unknown to the government to be misrepresentations. And they, they, if you sweep away all, that, all the fraudulent acts and the facts upon which the decision is based, the case falls of its own weight. So with that, uh, with the history of the criticism of Korematsu, we also have the validation of the individual men and of the laws themselves, uh, or, or rejections of the law themselves are based on. For example, in 1976, President Ford rescinded Executive Order 9066, stating, we now know what we should have known then. Not only was the evacuation wrong, but Japanese Americans were and are loyal Americans. Actually, we did, now we did, we did know it then, but it was suppressed from the public and from the Supreme Court. President uh, Carter authorized the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. And in the report concluded that the broad historical causes that shaped the exclusion and detention were race pre prejudice, war hysteria, and the lack of political leadership. President Reagan signed 442, which granted redress. All three petitioners received the highest award this country offers, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. President Obama bestowed that on Gordon Hirabayashi and Min Yasui. President Clinton bestowed that on Fred Korematsu. And finally, uh, Neil Katyal, who was the acting Solicitor General uh, during the Bush administration, issued a remarkable confession of error. Neil Katyal said, that in the original cases, the Solicitor General, my office, misled the attorney, uh, misled the court in Korematsu by withholding key facts which undermined the arguments on the internment. And that the case stands today as a reminder of the mistakes of the past. So there are so many proclamations, so many events, so many official uh, declarations, as well as the critiques of Korematsu that tell us that it's not a uh, a, a good law, and in fact, it's rarely used as, as a citation, and it's never used since uh, the early, late 50s to support any kind of invidious race discrimination against a racial minority. 
Um, but whether Korematsu is a legal precedent or not, I'm not sure it matters. And I had a talk with Paul Hoffman earlier, and we kind of concluded that the court of public opinion, as he put it and I put it, is probably more significant. And I think the political precedent is, uh, is more important. Because, you know, we see all these officials now calling for uh, the separation of Muslims, Syrians, nations like uh, Mitch talked about, talking about uh, that the Korematsu was, was correct or that the incarceration was uh, justified. Um, but I think Antonin Scalia, former, uh, former Supreme Court justice who recently died, said it pretty realistically. The Korematsu decision was wrong, but you'd be fooling yourself if you don't think it could happen again. And he you quote a Latin phrase, in times of war, the laws go silent. So that thrusts us into the political arena to understand and decide how we're going to pre prevent this from happening again, a Muslim re registry, mass incarceration of another group. I think during times of crisis or war, the laws tend to favor the president, the power tips toward the president, towards national security, and folks tend to err on the side of security rather than liberty. And to paraphrase Benjamin Franklin, who kind of warned against that, he said, those who choose scrutiny, uh, security over liberty deserve neither. So that in, in the bottom line is it's a political issue that we have to address. And when people say, well, you know, we have a precedent of incarcerating Japanese Americans, what does that mean? That means that you could, use, you could rely on some of the worst things you've ever done in this country to do anything you want? Can we reinstate slavery? Can we uh, force Native Americans into reservations? So we've done it before. There's a precedent. So say, just saying there's a precedent is not nearly enough. You've got to dig deeper and understand what is that precedent for? You know, is it for promoting social justice, moving people forward, or is it for suppressing people and oppressing them, which is what uh, some of the folks such as um, Carl Higby and Donald Trump's um, spokesperson person has talked about in terms of uh, justification for the incarceration. Uh, and, and the laws will, will not, some of the lessons are about law, they won't protect you solely. They're important, but you can't rely on them completely. And that's why, again, I'm talking about political power. Laws reflect the social political uh, interest at the time, and any country that can elect Trump could have a popular uprising supporting some of the things that happened to Japanese Americans. And despite my skepticism of the role of law, I still, there's one part of Korematsu that I, I cited that is critical, that the courts need to be able to use the highest standard of scrutiny, look really closely at governmental actions. They didn't do that. They threw up their hands and said, okay, we trust you, uh, military, in, in the uh, original decisions. But part of our job as lawyers to make sure that the courts use that power to uh, strict scrutiny, to look at beyond what the professed uh, uh, justifications are, and that's especially true when you look at the uh, incarceration cases. Um, I'd like to quote Sandra Day O'Connor in Hamdi, and while she didn't quite make a strong enough decision in that case, she made one, one of the very good statement. We have long since made it clear that a state of war is not a blank check for the president when it comes to the rights of this nation's citizens. So the courts have to act on that uh, in that vein. Uh, and why say political powers? The Japanese Americans are a great example of that. In 1942, we had virtually no allies. Nobody stood up for Japanese Americans, and they were sent to indefinite confinement. In 1988, we had a rainbow coalition of supporters, of allies, who helped push for redress, and we won an historic visit, uh, victory. So there's also lessons about dissent. In uh, 1942, very few people dissented from the decision to incarcerate Japanese Americans, and we had a civil rights disaster. Uh, Congress passed laws a month later, unanimously, by voice vote. The Supreme Court acquiesced meekly in the president's order, uh, and the public stayed silent. And we, again, experienced a terrible, terrible disaster. Had other Americans had the courage to speak out then, we might not even be here today. There are also lessons about individual courage. Fred, Gordon, Min, Mitsui Endo, stood up, and those three men became pariahs. They were outcasts. Today, they're known as heroes. So in conclusion, what can we do? I mean, you know, there is so much to be done. I think, first of all, you've got to find the courage to speak out. 
you got to find the courage to do something, to stand up for someone else whose rights are being jeopardized. Use social media, use Twitter. Challenge statements that are made, the Michelle Malkins, the Carl Higbee, Donald Trump is even, Trump has even suggested it was justified, the uh, incarceration. We need to challenge those. We got to challenge the statements recently were made into the uh, LA Times travel section, the letters to the editor. And we've got to go even further and look at who are those people that are writing those statements, because they're affiliated with more right-wing groups. This is not isolated acts by these people. This is part of a more con concerted program to lay the groundwork, I think. And I'm not a conspiracy theory person, but I do believe that there's a common interest that, of people who would like to see Muslims, Arabs uh, uh, suffer. Um, contribute to political causes, like the ACLU. Good pitch, huh? I'm serious. I'm dead serious because they have been fighting these fights. They fought it for Korematsu in 1942 in Hirabayashi, and they're still doing it today. So if we've learned anything from history, we have learned that we must stand with our Muslim and Arab American brothers, any marginalized group. Otherwise, our rights get trampled too. And we must not let history repeat itself again. So thank you very much. What happened to us was so important to our country because it affected our constitutional rights. And as citizens, the government put us in the camp, not giving them a, a chance to go to court to prove that we were innocent. They just put us in the camp. And they try to bury that. Well, I just feel that all people, regardless of their race, their background, religion, education, should all be treated equally. And that's uh, subject to the United States Constitution. That's something I truly, firmly believe in, equality. We will continue to tell the story and the experience, not only to, to, have, to, to attract the sympathy or anything like that, but to, to tell the country and the world something like this should never happen again. Our next speaker is Mr. Paul Hoffman. Mr. Hoffman was the legal director of the ACLU Foundation of Southern California for 10 years, specializing in constitutional and civil rights legislation, including First Amendment rights, discrimination, and international human rights. In 1994, he left the ACLU to start his own firm and is now a partner at Tromblum, Seplow, Harris, and Hoffman. In 1999, he was named one of the top lawyers in Los Angeles County by the Los Angeles Business Journal. He's taught more than 40 courses at schools such as Stanford Law, UCLA Law, and USC Law. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Paul Hoffman. Thank you, and it's a, it's a great honor to be asked to speak at this event. I'd like to join Dale in thanking you for braving the elements um, to be here today. Um, it's also a great honor to speak on the same uh, panel as Dale, who's uh, an icon and uh, whose work on these cases is something that has, um, has just been amazing and something I've always, uh, has been an inspiration to me. Um, when I heard uh, Trump supporters use the Korematsu decision, the original Korematsu decision, um, as a justification when they were talking about the registry of, um, of Muslims or detention of Muslims, I, I really couldn't believe it. Um, I, was, I recall driving when I heard it and nearly driving off the road. Um, I had thought that this that the court of public opinion had so discredited um, this precedent that there, would, there was just no possibility that anybody could do it, even the people that were uh, making these kinds of arguments about um, a Muslim exclusion and, and, and all the things that, that were being done. Uh, you know, I thought that Kori Matsu had joined the decisions like Dred Scott legalizing slavery as being um, something so beyond the pale that no one could do it. So my reaction was someone should do something about that. And 
the, sorry, the organizers of this event did something about that. Um, and it's, it's heartening. And I, I actually don't know that it's a coincidence that yesterday it did not rain like this. <laughs> um, and, and I think it did rain on, on Friday. And then the skies opened up. So it's, it's heartening um, to be here in the afterglow of the amazing marches from sea to shining sea that happened yesterday in terms of whether we're going to accept um, this kind of, the use of the precedent, the misuse of the precedent, and the kind of repressive actions that have been threatened. I want to, before I get to some of that, I'd like to just say a word about the ACLU and this entire issue. Um, and it, it, the ACLU's um, work on this ultimately was quite good, but not so good in the beginning. The national organization actually dropped the ball on, on internment in the beginning, and it was the lawyers in California um, that actually picked that ball up and said, we don't care what you say, uh, national organization, this is wrong. And I feel a personal um, connection to all that because um, the first two legal directors in the history of the ACLU Foundation of Southern California were Abraham Lincoln Weirin, Al, William, Al Weirin, who was part of the Corey Matsu case, the original case, and who fought uh, tenaciously uh, against internment. Um, and my immediate pre predecessor, Fred Okrand, um, also was part of the redress movement um, from the beginning. And I remember when I first met Fred, um, he told me the story of how he got involved, which was that one of his classmates at UCLA, an American citizen of Japanese-American ancestry, um, when he was called to war, he went and fought in the war. And his, his friend, as I recall, one of his best friends, went to the camps. And he just never got over that. He, never, he could never understand how that kind of injustice could be done under the Constitution. And so when he got back from fighting in the war, he decided that he had to take up this fight. And he was involved in cases like the Alien Land Law case, the Seifuji case, um, and other cases that tried to deal with the remnants of, um, and maybe not even only remnants, of um, the discrimination that, that was suffered by the Japanese American community. And he, in a sense, I feel like I'm speaking for him. Um, now, before addressing specifically the threats to the Muslim community and um, the relevance of, of Korematsu and the legacy of Korematsu to those issues, I think it might be useful just to remind ourselves of the range of threats that we're facing. Um, and, and I just thought I'd focus on, a, on two or three. And, I, and you'll forgive me, but as a civil rights and civil liberties lawyer, um, I have been obsessing about these issues for the last few months uh, and waiting to see what, when the other shoe would drop. I'm still waiting for that. But in the course of the campaign, for example, one of the things that was talked about was a mass deportation force. Right? And there's estimates of at least 11 million undocumented people in the country. If, if he was to actually try to deport everybody, um, there would be an estimated 15,000 arrests a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Think about that. And in order to accomplish that, they'd have to hire hundreds of additional enforcement, actually thousands of additional, tens of thousands of additional immigration enforcement officers and hundreds of thousands of additional immigration detention beds, some estimates as much as 400,000 beds um, to detain the people that they would be putting through a system that would lack all due process because the system is already overburdened and, and even with what they're dealing with now, it might take years of detention before even the basic rights um, to, to even contest your detention um, could be done. So you have a program threatened that even if it was implemented at a fraction of what they're talking about, um, would lead to the kind of militarization and surveillance society um, that's consistent with a dictatorship and not with a free, open, and equal society. Um, 
That's not the only threat to immigration, but let me move on to another one that I've been obsessing over, which is torture. Um, during the campaign, um, Trump spoke of the benefits of waterboarding and other forms of, of torture. This was another one that, where I almost ran off the road. Um, and you know, there's the question of whether the president w will take us out of the Convention Against Torture, for example. We are parties to a, 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 an international treaty that bans torture and cruel and inhuman degrading treatment and punishment. A president can just do that. Doesn't require the Senate, doesn't require Congress. President can just take us out of this um, treaty and by doing so could undermine international protections against torture that protect people around the world um, and in our country. Um, I'm working on an ACLU case right now against two psychologists who were the ones who created the enhanced interrogation um, program that was used in bases in Afghanistan and Iraq and in Guantanamo. Um, and so far, we're doing pretty good. We're moving towards a trial in June, and um, the judge is letting us take testimony of all the people that were the architects of this program. Uh, the way that lawsuits are used to, to hold government officials and others accountable. The worry, though, is that the, the new Justice Department, as soon as it gets organized, and one can only hope that it won't get organized very quickly, um, will decide to assert state secrets privilege and try to prevent the case from going forward, try to prevent accountability at all costs, and try to uh, preserve the right um, to torture. And we already can see that, for example, the person that's nominated to be the head of the Civil Rights Division has spent his entire career um, opposing civil rights cases, voting rights cases, other cases. Um, and this, so there are gonna be thousands of appointees, political appointees, in all sorts of areas that are gonna affect civil rights and civil liberties. So we're gonna to have to be vigilant um, even more than we ever were. Um, and finally, before getting on to, to the, the issues of Muslim registry and, and the legacy of Korematsu, just a, a few words about our free, the threats to free speech. Um, we have a president who cannot seem to abide any criticism. Um, and he has also called for changes in our libel laws uh, to make it possible for public officials to attack their critics with libel suits. Now, um, lest you think that President Trump is the first one to think about things like this, um, one of my themes today is that, and, and I think it's something that Dale said, and it's what Justice Scalia said, um, there are recurring threats to our civil liberties that have happened since the beginning of the Republic. These threats are, are, are truly part of the American experience. And in President Adams in 1798 convinced Congress to pass the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, and these were passed because of a widespread fear um, that the alien radicalism of the French Revolution might infect the body politic. Does that sound familiar? Um, it was never used, the alien. It, it allowed the president to deport any non-citizen he deemed dangerous without judicial review of any kind. Uh, that was the, what the act did. The Sedition Act allowed for criminal penalties for the criticism of public officials. The act prohibited, and I quote, false, scandalous, and malicious writing or writings against the government of the United States or either House of Congress or the President with the intent to defame them or bring them into contempt or disrepute or to excite against them the hatred of the good people of the United States. As of July 14, 1798. And now, unlike the Alien Act, there were, there were about two dozen prosecutions under the Sedition Act. Uh, and these were mainly used to target the political opponents of um, President Adams and the Federalist Party. And those were the days when the Federalists were contending for power with the Republican Party, um, the Republicans led by Thomas Jefferson, uh, who became president in 1800. And none of the cases ever got to the Supreme Court at that time, so there's never any ruling 
Um, but, and President Jefferson pardoned everybody that had been convicted under the Sedition Act. Now, can you imagine how many prosecutions would be generated by yesterday's marches? <laughs> I mean, the mind boggles. And I'm thinking that, although I'm not sure it provided for the death penalty, I would think that in the case of Alec Baldwin, he would be facing the death penalty <laughs> at this point. Um, now, the, those acts expired, but I think we have to be pretty vigilant about whether things like them might come to pass with a Congress that might um, listen to what uh, Mr. Trump has to say about this. Um, now, those laws were not the only way that free speech has been suppressed by libel, and I'm focusing on libel because um, President Trump is focused on libel. Um, state libel laws were used to destroy civil rights organizations in the civil rights movement. Um, that led to the famous decision of New York Times versus Sullivan in 1964. And one of the reasons that that's an important decision, it's not only because it promulgated very sturdy protections, or at least reasonably sturdy protections against the kind of libel suits that Mr. Trump has threatened. If you're a public official, it's very hard to win a libel suit um, in, under, under New York Times versus Sullivan. But one of the things that New York Times versus Sullivan did uh, is it said that in the court of public opinion, the Alien and Sedition Acts had been deemed unconstitu unconstitutional. That it didn't take a, a um, actually, is there a water someplace? This is my grandson, the hoarder of water, uh, the recorder of uh, statements. Um, and I'm counting on him to be a lawyer because we're gonna need to keep fighting these things for as long as uh, he's alive, probably. Um, but what, what, what the, the court said was, even though there had never been a Supreme Court decision overruling or finding unconstitutional the Alien and, and Sedition Acts, that they clearly were unconstitutional and that it's part of our, of our constitutional heritage. And I think one of the hopes, obviously, and based on all the things that, that Dale said, is that um, the fact that Kori Matsu um, is a bad precedent, something that cannot be used, has become so much part of our political and legal culture that, that it can't come to pass. Now, um, one of the, 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 the other things that I'd, I'd wanted to say is that, um, and I'll probably say it a few times, is that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance, right? And I think when you talk about nails in the coffins of precedents, um, it's not clear that those nails are ever long enough. Um, and I think that we have to, as, as Dale was saying, um, fight um, to make sure that the nails stay, stay put. Now, with respect to the Muslim community and the legacy of Korematsu, um, you know, you, if you remember, during the campaign, um, it was threatened by, by Trump and, uh, and his supporters to create a Muslim registry, to, to ban Muslims from coming into the country, um, perhaps to detain them, uh, to use racial profiling, to look into the surveillance of mosques, um, a whole range of, of, of issues. And it's not a long jump, speaking of, of J. Edgar Hoover in the bad sense, uh, it's not a long jump from surveillance to disruption. Uh, one of the cases I did as a AC, young ACLU lawyer was a case in this community challenging the red squad of the LAPD where the Los Angeles Police Department regularly put um, undercover agents into political groups and had them engage in disruptive activities. And this included going into mosques and places of religious freedom and, and a whole range of groups from the right to the left. Um, and I had thought when we settled that case, and there were a number of other cases um, at the time, and there was the church committee report about why the FBI's counterintelligence program was wrong, that the nails were in that particular coffin. Um, but with the Patriot Act and, and, and other things, when, as we've come to know, when, when there's fear and people are afraid for one reason or another, um, sometimes we can't um, count on that. Now, as, as was mentioned by Dale, the Corey Matzo has been used a number of times by Trump supporters to 
seemingly support the kinds of acts that they wanted to take against the Muslim community. Um, and um, I guess the question is, should we, should we be worried? Now, this is where my talk overlaps a little bit with Dell's in terms of what um, the current legacy of Korematsu is. So I don't want to repeat everything that he said, but I would repeat that what Justice Scalia said in 2014. I mean, he said that, um, and, and the, the quote, I think, is, well, of course, Cory Matsu was wrong, and I think we have repudiated in a later case, but you're kidding yourself if you think the same thing will not happen again, right? And this is Scalia saying this. Uh, there's a 1995 case. It's an affirmative action case, which has the um, called Adirond um, Constructors versus Pena, which is the place where the most direct repudiation of Cory Matsu as a precedent comes. Uh, Justice Souter made similar comments in the Hamdi versus Rumsfeld case that um, Dale referred to, one of the Guantanamo cases. Uh, Justice Kennedy also made a similar set of comments in, in an FCC case. But in that same case, Justice Thomas suggested that Cory Matsu might have some relevance um, and that national security might provide the kind of pressing public necessity that might justify at least some forms of racial discrimination. So you have at least one justice on the Supreme Court. And on another occasion, Chief Justice Rehnquist said, the real problem with Cory Matsu is that they detain citizens. It was perfectly fine to detain everybody else, um, but not citizens. Uh, now, of course, Ju Chief Justice Rehnquist is no longer on the court, and, Chief, and Justice Scalia is no longer there, obviously. Um, the justices that um, Mr. Trump has identified for possible placement on the Supreme Court, I think he has a list of 20, and none of them we would be confident about. You know, they, I, I think that they would all be more likely to support Justice Thomas's view on this. So where does that leave us in terms of the actual court? Um, it probably leaves us in a situation where this court, um, I hope and I think, would repudiate Cory Matsu as a, as a, as a decision. Um, but I worry about it. Um, and I don't think we can take it for granted. I think that we, it, it, we really have to continue to fight any even slight inkling that that decision has any validity, any application to anything currently going on. Now, I mentioned the Alien and Sedition Acts, and one of the other acts I'd just like to mention quickly, because it's another one that makes me crazy, um, is the Enemy Alien Act, which has a great relevance to Cory Matsu and is actually sort of the basis of it. That, that goes back to the beginning of the Republic, too, and there, it authorizes a president during a declared war to detain, expel, or otherwise restrict the freedom of any citizen over 14 years old of the country with which we are at war. Um, and it was used as early as uh, the War of 1812. President Madison used it against British subjects. President Wilson used it during World War I to control German, Germans and Austro-Hungarians. And I didn't, when I say control, it didn't mean put them in camps, but it meant take action to control their movements. Um, and so one of the things that I worry about when I wake up at night worried about what might happen the next day, uh, now I'm going to start really having more trouble in that regard, um, is that somebody might say, as Donald Trump has actually said quite a few times, is that we're at war with the Muslim world, whereas we're at war with Islamic terrorism. Um, there's not a declared war yet. Can he get Congress to declare war on a religion? Um, can he get it to declare war in some way that would use the enemy alien act in this way? Does it matter whether they declare war? Can they argue to the Supreme Court and other courts that the same kind of justifications that led to the passage and use of the enemy alien act justify um, the kinds of repressive acts that they want to take against anybody that comes from a country where there is an Al-Qaeda cell or ISIS or any of that. Um, 
we need to condemn those kinds of actions. We need to watch to see that Congress doesn't pass them in the middle of the night or as um, an addendum to a 790-page reconciliation bill. Um, these are the things. So what do we do? Um, one of the things that I did when I was at the ACLU um, was I sat down one weekend and I read all of the, the um, newsletters that the ACLU has from, they were called the Open Forum, many of you may get it, uh, and it goes back to the 1920s, um, and, and it still is published. Uh, it was an eye-opening experience to me because um, the thing that, that became clear was that every generation faces almost exactly the same kinds of civil liberties and civil rights challenges. Um, attacks on immigrants of various kinds, uh, racial and religious discrimination, threats to free speech and assembly of various kinds, police misconduct, the list goes on. Um, and um, there has been progress, clearly, over the years. I, mean, I can remember arguing gay rights cases, for example, in the 1980s uh, in front of judges that were openly hostile. Um, and now the, the Supreme Court of the United States has accepted gay marriage. Uh, and I think one of the lessons there is that the political culture changed and no one's going back, which I think is what has to happen in every one of these areas. Um, and I think, as, as Dale said, um, it's important for people of goodwill to stand up whenever anyone's rights are being abused. Um, Corey Matsu is only going to remain discredited on the junk heap of history if we make it so. Right? We can't ever forget about that. Um, and I also agree that, that the enforcement of civil and human rights is only partially about lawyers. And I, for my mind, a smaller part about lawyers. Uh, I think lawyers do really important things, and we certainly love it when people praise our work, and it should be praised. Um, but I think it's mainly about a vibrant and active people, everybody, insisting on their rights. Lawyers can do nothing without without those actions. And so I think the marches yesterday were probably the most hopeful civil liberties and civil rights um, sign that I've seen since the election. Um, he'll only get away with uh, Muslim registry and repressive actions if we let him, right? Um, now, one of the things, um, um, th th I would also say that there are other constitutional provisions that we can use to fight these kinds of repressive things. I mean, we're going to make, there'll be constitutional challenges based on the First Amendment, the right of freedom of speech, the right of freedom of religion, um, equal protection and due process guarantees. So no matter what they do, when they try to create a registry, there'll be a fight. It violates the Privacy Act, for one thing, if you record people's um, First Amendment activities. Now, of course, Congress can do away with the Privacy Act, but they can't away, do away so easily with the Constitution. So we'll be fighting that, but it becomes even more important that the entire country rise up and, and, um, and oppose that. So I, I would say that if Muslims are asked to register, um, I think the only answer is that every one of us is a Muslim. Um, and I know that if they did that, um, I'm a Muslim, um, and I hope you would be too. So thanks um, for allowing me to be a participant in this. I know we won. Both Dale and I thought it would be really great if there could be a time for questions and answers. Thank you. We're going to bring out two chairs if you want to consider work. OK, we have a few minutes for questions and answers for either Dale or Paul. Are there any? Questions in the audience. Hi, um, I guess I'll just sit here. Okay, um, my name is Richard Leong. Um, my question is, um, as a millennial and like a young person that's starting to become very inspired and want to be engaged in politics, one of the most sort of, um, I guess the most recurring piece of advice I've heard throughout this election season and with the inauguration is call your local representative, right? Be active, be engaged, call your local representative because they are beholden to us. We're the voters that put them in power, right? My question in terms of watching the review of how Korematsu played out and kind of where it applies you know, in the future is, how beholden is the judicial branch and the courts to the court of public opinion, right? 
when we think about the legislative side of it, that's where the that's where the I guess the encouragement is from me, right? It's like call your representative because they need to know what you feel. My question is how beholden is the judicial side to that process? I'll speak from Korematsu. It's obvious that they were very beholden to public opinion because you know, public opinion shaped the view of Japanese Americans as uh, as dangerous, and the court adopted that. You could see that also in a case that uh, Paul mentioned about gay rights. You know, they were, homosexual activity was outlawed by the Supreme Court, and then later on, as times changed, the society changed, the Supreme Court went back and reversed that. Same with uh, the Dred Scott slavery. Eventually, we get to Elaine Brown and uh, Brown versus Board of Education. So absolutely, it lives, they're human beings. They live in a social, political milieu, just like we all do. So they will be influenced by what the public does. Um, I'll give you one other example. Um, in 1987, actually, I guess 30 years to this month, um, there were some Palestinians, non-citizens here in LA, that were arrested under the McCarran-Walter Act, which is a 1952 McCarthy era act that allowed deportation of people based on their uh, allegiance to communism and other First Amendment activity. Um, we had that case in front of a judge that had been appointed by President Reagan. A huge fan of civil rights and civil liberties at the time, in our view. Um, that judge, after asking us for briefing about the Alien and Sedition Acts, among other things, um, was influenced, I think, by the fact that by 1987, um, McCarthyism had run its course, that in the court of public opinion, um, those kinds of actions based on, on freedom of speech were really not to be tolerated in the political and legal culture. And he ruled in our favor and declared it unconstitutional. Now, I've certainly been in loads of cases where the court of public opinion hasn't mattered. Um, and, and we've lost. But there are many situations, I think as Dale said, judges are part of a political uh, and social milieu, and they're usually influenced by what people are thinking and doing around them. And it helps a, a huge amount if there's the kind of energy that was shown yesterday. I think it's a, it communicates to everybody in the, in the political system and judicial system what people care about. And if I can add to that, the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians, when they were talking about the social political climate that surrounded World War II when a lot of these decisions were made, talked about the racial prejudice, the wartime hysteria, and the failure of political leadership as being the main causes for the decisions that were made. And those are all things that are influenced by the general uh, public and by the general population. And while there may not be as direct a relationship with the legislative branch, certainly the judicial branch is affected by that social political climate. Yes, Don Hata. I'll put his name up there for you. <laughs> well, my name is Don Hata. I'm a retired professor of history. Um, maybe four or five years ago now, uh, Dale Minami was a, a keynote speaker. Uh, here at Janum, and after the program, I asked Dale, these Days of Remembrance programs each year focus on celebrating the achievement of the redress movement, apology, one-time tax repayment of $20,000 to survivors. And I said, aren't we getting a bit complacent to celebrate this? It could happen again. And lo and behold, uh, we now have the very same conditions that the commission um, cited as the causes of our incarceration 75 years ago. So with that in mind, what has been the impact of the redress movement in remembering uh, the events of 75 years ago? I see the impact as being virtually zero. Here we have a president who's designated henchman you know, very, very clearly, without any kind of embarrassment about their own ignorance, you know, say we can, it can be done again. 
Uh, you did a very good job, I think, of trying to clarify the very complex issue of the wartime cases versus the Coram Nobin cases. A lot of people, you know, the, the majority of people I know, think that because the Coram Nobis cases vacated the convictions of people like Fred Korematsu, that that totally wiped out the wartime Supreme Court cases, which is not the case. Those cases, whether or not you say they are held up as good law or not, are still the precedent. And so here's the question after all that. As we look at these examples of uh, exuberant uh, outrage, like the marches yesterday. What is the point? What is it all going to lead to? And I'd like to get your re uh, reactions to this. I think that it is a very good idea that we encourage students to not simply keep regurg regurgitating the same old stuff about Japanese Americans in World War II, uh, but have them embark on fresh areas of research, such as since the nine political appointees to the body called the U.S. Supreme Court have not revisited those wartime cases, which therefore still stand as precedents, maybe we should go beyond the U.S. Supremes and ask for an international war crimes tribunal. That might embarrass the U.S. government and current and future elected officials, that we go beyond the box, inside of the box thinking that we've been trapped by. I, I posed that to Dale four or five years ago, and to his credit, when I asked, what were your plans to uh, uh, be on the Supreme Court? And Dale said, we didn't even think about that because we were so glad we got as far as the US Supreme Court. And reasonably, he and his team of lawyers were tired and burned out, and they'd sacrificed their, their careers and everything else. So I'm not putting the burden on Dale Minami or the Coram Nobis lawyers, but I'm putting the burden on a future generation of students and scholars and I want to see whether you endorse the idea. Let's go beyond the US Supreme Court. After all, the, the, the basic triad, checks and balances, do not work. The Congress has not declared war since World War II. Give Dale a chance to answer that question. Well, I, I tend to disagree about Day of Remembrance. I don't see them as celebrations. And all the ones I've been to, you know, you can celebrate redress, but most of it is about remembering the hardships, the terrible things that happened to Japanese Americans. And I don't think just because you can't quantify it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. How, how, how can you quantify the marches that were happening the other day? If, if you can't quantify it, does that mean you don't have any impact? Or do you mean you think you shouldn't do it? What I agree with, though, is that instead of telling the same old story over and over, you need to tell it with fresh eyes and fresh voices so that, like, the Holocaust is being presented in so many different ways. And it's in, in new ways that uh, capture a new audience that get the attention of millennials. And the Day of Remembrances should do those kind of things. Japanese Americans should tell these stories in new ways. And they're trying to in, in, in the uh, legislation to get uh, college degrees for graduates, for example. You've got to tell it so that you don't have to tell the same old story over and over and hear the same old song. I totally agree with that. As far as the world court, you're right, we didn't go that far. Boy, we were just uh, concentrating on, one, getting back to our lives, because we did this for free, to, for trying to make a living. Uh, we, would try, we had planned to go to every uh, constitutional law professor and course in the country and inject our quorum nobis cases into this, uh, their Supreme Court discussion. And we were not very successful because we just didn't have enough money or time to get to those folks. But, but some folks are doing it now. Actually, there's more and more discussion about the quorum nobis cases as it affects uh, the Supreme Court. I've just learned this fairly recently because this only happened kind of recently. And I think you're absolutely right. Those cases get conflated. And they shouldn't be. They should be separated and understood in the context of so Korematsu is still present, but bad precedent. And let me turn it over to Paul about the world court issues, you know, because he's, inter he's done a lot of international human rights law as well. Well, on, on the international part, um, there aren't really international courts where you could bring this. In other words, the International <laughs> Court of Justice um, which is the main court, can only be accessed by states rather than individuals. Um, and the International Criminal Court that was established in 1998 doesn't apply to events that occurred 
prior to its establishment. Um, there may be ways to bring more international attention to the issues. Uh, and that, you know, that for example, there have been, you know, private international criminal courts that have dealt with certain issues and have, got, have been very good in terms of um, identifying the discrepancy between U.S. practices and international norms. And that might be something that would actually be a great way to perpetuate uh, and, and say in different ways the it. things that, that, that they are. That, but the one thing I'd, I'd take issue with you on is, uh, a little bit is that um, I see that the work that has been done over the years uh, for the re by the redress movement and, and, and all the work that's been done since um, has had an impact, it seems to me. I mean, for example, when, when all of those men were taken to Guantanamo, you had lawyers all across the country, including lawyers in big conservative law firms, representing them. And they were representing them because of the principle that you shouldn't detain people uh, without access to habeas corpus and access to freedoms. I mean, I think what's, ha and the Supreme Court, even though it hasn't done as much as some of us might like, actually ruled in their favor. I don't think that would have happened without the, the outrage about Cory Matsu. I think that that's become ingrained in the way that not only justices think, but the way lawyers think. Um, and to give you one final example, when Carl Higby made the ridiculous statement that he did on Fox News, Megyn Kelly, responded to him and said, you're relying on Cory Matsu, are you nuts? Now if Megyn Kelly has, if it's seeped into <laughs> Megyn Kelly, somebody's doing a pretty good job. Great point, Paul. Other questions, yes. Hi, I'm Christine Dennehy from the History Department at Cal State Fullerton. And I'm going to just show my ignorance if you could just define for me what quorum nobis means and what the significance is. <laughs> and also, you mentioned, um, Mr. Manami, the three strong dissenters in the Korematsu case. Just in terms of legal training and you know what that means, can that ever be used as precedent? Or what's the significance of that except that it happened and we should take note of it for the historical record? Quorum knows we had to look that up too when we first uh, came in. And so we tend to be so familiar we use it without explaining it. But it's the old ancient writ called before us. But what it really means, it's like habeas corpus. It means you could challenge your conviction after your sentence has been served and you could get it overthrown if you can show what they call manifest injustice. Or you can show a fundamental unfairness in the proceeding. So we had to show that there was a fraud committed on the Supreme Court which can caused by the misconduct of the lawyers, which resulted in a manifest injustice, which the courts agreed with us on. So uh, that's the answer to the quorum nobis question. As far as, uh, you mentioned the dissents. Dissents are not as strong as what they call holdings, the, the majority opinion. But interestingly enough, uh, Justice Murphy, his dissent in Korematsu finds its way into one of the Guantanamo cases, the Hamdi case. And it's just almost a, just a per parenthesis where uh, Justice uh, O'Connor is saying, uh, in, 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 a, in uh, agreement with, with the dissent, that we have the right to oversee or uh, analyze military decisions. And so it's a, it becomes a very strong statement that is adopted by majority opinion. And that could happen in cases. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times they can uh, be influential uh, down the line. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the, the justices speak to each other and they speak to the nation in, in their opinions. And I think dissenting opinions are basically statements that majority, you have the votes now and we're going to have to go your way. But you're wrong. And someday we'll be vindicated. Uh, and often they are. And I think that's been true in the, for the dissenters in Cory Matsu. I think they were making a statement for history um, that someday the country would get over um, what led to the majority decision and would come to its senses. You know, Professor Dennehy, your question about Coram Nobis is one that a lot of people have. And it really, truly was a moment of serendipity that even brings us today to be even talking about it. Dale, can you talk a little bit about how you learned about Coram Nobis and Peter Iron's role and how that came about? Because it's a great story. 
There, people have different versions of that, and as you research it, you'll see, you'll know that uh, one of the versions is um, uh, Frank Schumann, who was one of the lawyers who, uh, for Yasui, uh, said that he studied it and he had mentioned it to one of the commissioners, Bill Maratani, who then uh, mentioned this to Peter Irons, one of the people who found the original documents, and then Peter figured out that he could use this as a device. He brought it to us because he didn't know how to, he wasn't a litigator and we were. So that's one version. The other version that is either coincidental and maybe not too uh, contradictory is Peter Irons brought his own quorum nobis action. When he, he was uh, convicted and served a sentence for selective service failure to violate, he resisted the Vietnam War, went to prison, mm -hmm. and he later brought a quorum nobis action uh, which was successful. So Peter independently knew about this writ of quorum, era quorum nobis. I have no doubt that Frank and uh, Chuman had he had written about it before too, so he knew about it too. So whatever his version is correct, all we know is the serendipity of, of us being involved in this undertaking and being allowed to, to bring this writ. If I can complicate it just a little bit more. <laughs> habeas corpus, the writ of habeas corpus and the writ of quorum nobis go back to ancient English practice. And there were writs that you had to follow to get to a particular court, whether it was the Star Chamber or another, the King's Bench or something like that. What habeas corpus meant was basically bring us the body. If you had somebody in custody and the question was, was their detention lawful? Quorum nobis was, well, the body's already gone and there's no continuing um, hold on that body. So in other words, in Peter Irons' case, he, noth, there was nothing other than the conviction that was holding him down, but he wanted to challenge the conviction. And the writ of quorum nobis gave somebody who was not in custody or subject to the continuing supervision of the state an ability to challenge the legality of their past conviction. You, you know, to add to that a little bit, interestingly, to, to, to tie in what Don, uh, Professor Hada said, and what you said, that uh, whether the redress movement had any impact. You know, in, in subsequent Guantanamo cases, in cases where you could imprison somebody, you know, without charges, without notice, et cetera, the whole notion of habeas corpus was going to be undercut by the government. They were essentially trying to take jurisdiction away from federal courts, so we wouldn't have this habeas corpus that arose from the great writ, the whole basis of our Constitution almost. In almost all this decision, it turns out to be 5-4. In other words, we barely made it to allow that this due process right continues to exist. And this is what the influence that Paul talked about of redress in the Japanese movement to, to, in the Commission on Wartime Relocation. Without that uh, exposing the types of injustice that occurred at the Supreme Court, in our case and other cases, you know, I, I think it does actually influence the way these justices think. And the only other little tidbit I have of why that's true is my cousin works for Justice uh, Kennedy, and she had told me over and over that he was so fascinated by the Korom Korematsu case that in privately thought that was just terrible decision. And I'm, I think it, the redress movement and the whole notion of what the Japanese Americans have done in support of Muslims has had a very positive effect. Okay, so the question is, what do you think about all the young lawyers that were active in the march yesterday across the United States? No, no, and some of the ones that are retired now that could de devote full time to this, getting them organized, to have a watch organization on Trump. Yeah. Thank you. My answer, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> but I also think it's wonderful because lawyers are acting not in their legal capacity, but in their political capacity. Because just because you're a lawyer doesn't mean you're not a citizen, that you can't be active as well in other, other forums. Can't say it any better than that. <laughs> All right, can we give a hand to both Mr. Paul Hoffman and Dale Minardi? I want to thank you both for coming out.
Before you leave today, a couple of things. We have surveys that either have been passed out or are out in the lobby, if you please can fill them out. We also have a table outside that is promoting a book uh, called Fred Korematsu Speaks Up. It's a children's book, but actually one with, filled with much information. You may want to take a look at it. We're not selling the book, we're just promoting it at this point. And also there are flyers outside for a East-West player coming up called Residents Elsewhere, which will talk about the uh, experience during World War II. On behalf of Gopher Broke National Education Center, I want to thank all of you for braving the elements again and coming out. But more importantly, on behalf of the veterans and their families, I want to thank you all for your ongoing commitment to preserving America's promise for equality for everyone here in the United States. Thank you. Our speakers will stick around for a little bit. Drive safely. Come to our exhibit. Enjoy the day.